when I went away to this conference, the whole topic was his grace is sufficient. His grace. Say, his grace is sufficient. Now, sufficiency means over and above. It doesn't mean just enough. Sufficient means you don't need any more. You got so much of it, you don't need any more. It's sufficient. It's all you would ever need. It abounds. It, it overflows in your life. So what I'm going to do today is attempt to begin to show you another level or two of grace because grace is in levels. You know, Parker was talking to you about the saving grace, right, and the forgiving grace and the grace of love. But I want you to understand even a deeper, a deeper key to that that will totally give you transformation in your life. Now, the, one of the things I taught on the topic of was the grace gifts while I was there. And I'll show you a few, a couple testimonies. Uh, they got a video testimony of, of what went on there. But when we look at that, we see that in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, right, where it talks about the nine gifts of spirit, that God gave the nine gifts of spirit, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecies, uh, miracles, healing, and gift of faith. Those are what? They call them charisma. They're grace gifts. The word charisma in the Greek is made up of two words, and the first part of it is charis. And what is charis? It's talking about the, it is the grace of God. What is the grace of God? The unmerited favor of God, the free gift of God. So anything in life that we're graced with, we didn't work for. It's a gift. If I operate in the grace of God, it's not on my power. It's the grace of God. And there's a big difference there as we get into this today. If I get to this one key point that I believe it'll be like light switches going off in your heart, in your mind, and you'll never see yourself or God the same again. You'll never see or relate to yourself or relate to God the way you have in the past. It will be such a revelation, I believe. It will just touch it today. But I believe it's going to just be a whole new foundation for your faith and your walk with Christ. Amen? So they're going to show, uh, I was there last year speaking as well. They're going to show you a lady testifying about a miracle. His son is almost blind and God healed his eye and how he's doing. And then you'll see a couple quick just healings that took place there. And then I'm going to, and, and what I want you to realize, even this is the grace of God. This is the grace gift. It's not me healing anyone. I can't heal anyone. It's the grace of God in me. What is grace? It's endowment. It's gifts. It's, it's parts of God, right? So as we get into this, let's watch this for about three or four minutes total, I think is all it is, and then I'll be right back up. Tell a pastor here that's just received this gift of faith. What happened to your family last year? Right here. You're standing right about where that camera Praise the Lord. <laughs> I want to thank God last year this time. I want to thank God because... It's one year. I was saying it um, yesterday before they saw the video. The only video in my it's one year anniversary of my shoulder. My shoulder was burning. I couldn't lift anything. I couldn't lie down on this shoulder. And I was so afraid because it's something my mom, my late mom suffered from till, till death. So I was like, where is this pain from? But since that time till now, I can move my shoulder as, as I can do anything with my shoulder. And for my son, I want to thank God because he couldn't do without his glasses. The moment he woke up in the morning, he has to look for his glasses. Sometimes we'll be, we'll be like, what's going on? You know, before, before we start laughing, we thought it was a joke until he became very serious. I became a burden to my life. Is this how he's going to be like forever with his glasses? But I want to thank God since last year to now, even when we went for the doctors at the eye appointment, God has done more than ever we thought that we would do for his eyes. He can he only wear it to it. Sometimes I leave it at home to go to school. It doesn't even go with the glasses. So I just want to give God all the way. Amen. Love you. Here. Start from here. What's your ear about? This year? I love, I love opening people's ears. Oh, you spirit of deafness? I adjure you right now. I adjure you right now. You spirit of deafness. I command you, loose your hope. Feel that moving in there? Feel that moving in there? I command, oh yeah, just replace that bone that's been damaged. Oh, I see you were hit or that fell or something there, but you were young on that side of your head. You just need a little bit of new ear drum and bone right there. That's all. That's no big deal for God. Feel that? 
you can hear it. Because a minute ago, you were like, well, from a one to ten, how's it, how much better can you hear? From a one to ten scale, how much better can you hear? Well, that's not good enough. My God's a God of perfection. All right, Father, we got that much. We got that much. We got that much. Start counting how many I count how many times he went. Awesome, yeah, it's a kind of called a lazy eye, or you got blindness from blinding that eye, or what? What? You can't tell. You can't see out of it as well, or is it not much? Well, goodness gracious. I know a physician that can fix that. Now, God loves you so much. Your daughter, he knows your daughter needs to come home, and he instantly held arthritis. Do you believe your God has enough power to make your eye whole? I do too. Behold, blindness, go! Blindness, go! I command this eye to be normal. I mean, this is wow. I can just see the rise in your eye. I, 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 I mean, I might be crazy. It's like a, it was like, I call it like a, a real lazy eye, you know, like, like the tendons and stuff not holding, da, 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 da. Look at you. You weren't tracking me with that eye before. Could you not see like, more like, what? I can't see what's at It doesn't coordinate. How about that? You see straight now. Yeah. Straight. It's never coming back again. So she was almost blind in the one eye, and I. I thought that at first it was a lazy eye. Then when she explained it, it made sense. She was, her eyes didn't cross. Her eyes went like that. She had one eye way, stayed like that. So she always was turned like this to see. And what you didn't see, I prayed for her in the beginning. And God gave me a word about a daughter that I didn't know she had a daughter. And I began to talk to her about her daughter and how God wants to bring her home. And then... God instantly healed her of arthritis. So she was excited about that. Well, then I looked at her and saw her eye, and I'm like, well, can you see? Not very good out of that eye, very little. I said, well, okay, that's when I prayed. So what I want you to understand is that's not me, right? I don't get to choose when that happens. That's the grace of God. And whenever God opens the door, gives me an opportunity to do those kinds of things, then I do them. If I just jump out here and do it on my own, nothing's going to happen. It only happens the gifts of God operate because they're his gifts, not man's gifts, not mine or yours. When those nine gifts, any of those nine gifts begin to operate, they're God's gifts that he graces for that moment, for that instant for you. Now, that's, that's, that's a grace gift. Now, 
Here's what I want you to understand about grace. Grace is way more than what we think grace is as a virtue. So let's look at 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. <clears throat> let's talk about it here for a minute. Ch 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 7. It says, and, let, and this is Paul, right? This is Paul. And here he is. He's battling Satan. He has, a, <clears throat> he's a battling a thorn in the flesh and, you know, Bible people and a lot of different people try to say, oh, it was, you know, sick eyes or pain or crippled. Or, but if you research it out, the Greek says messenger of Satan. So what it was, he was being buffeted and just drained of all of his energy and strength just because Satan was just constantly bombarding him with thoughts and feelings and emotions that he just couldn't seem to uh, uh, take care of and other things that bothered him and people were bothering him and he knew that wasn't the way it was supposed to be. So here it is, it says, unless I should be exalted above measure of abundance of revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I exalt above measure. Now verse eight, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times for it to depart from me. So he asked God on three different occasions, Lord, take this buffeting, take this wearing me down, take this pain that the enemy is putting on me away from me. Verse nine, and, he, and then here's God's conversation with him. And God said to him, he said, God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Now, when we read that, we think, oh, God's love, God's hope. No, God said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is is made perfect in weakness. And then he goes on to talk about, now I got a revelation of that and I move beyond it. And he even talks about where he's healed in it later. And he says, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities, which is sickness or weakness, uh, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in approach, reproaches, in needs, and persecutions, distress, distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What's he saying? When he gets in those situations, he begins to request and, and grow in God's grace so that he can overcome those situations. Now, he was the one with the greatest revelation other than Jesus himself, right? He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament through the unction of the Holy Spirit. But when you think about that conversation as Paul, that Paul is having, it's, it's really amazing to me that, that we don't quite get everything about the sufficiency. Like I told you, sufficient means enough or more than enough. It means super abundant. And God is saying, my grace is more than enough for anything that you would ever want, that you would ever need in your life. So as we begin to think about that, we all have challenges that come. That's what life is. You're, you're living in a cursed world and you face challenges. You face physical challenges, uh, emotional challenges, challenges with family, challenges with career, challenges with work. What I want you to realize is challenges will always come, but they're momentary, they're temporary. Challenges don't last forever. They go away one way or another or they win or you win or something, but eventually challenges, you move beyond challenges. But God's grace never changes. God's grace is all sufficient. God's grace is forever. And when we begin to realize that and we begin to think on those terms, it can help us in our walk with God and it can help us in the means, guys, that we begin to rely on what? God's strength, not our strength. God's grace, not our grace. So as we go on with this now, now from the scriptures we understand that the only virtue, uh, that grace is the only sufficient virtue. And I'll get into that in just a second. Now John 10, what's it say? John 10, 10. Jesus said, Satan comes what? But to steal, kill, and destroy. But he said, I come to give life and to give life what? More abundantly. And that word there more abundantly is the same Greek words that's used for sufficiency. Now, what did he say? I came, Satan came to what? Still kill, destroy. What did he do? He came to give life and to give life how? More abundantly. To give you life, blessings upon top of blessings. Abundance upon abundance. Devil bad, God good. That's the John 10, 10 line, isn't it? Devil bad, God good. And as we begin to understand this, 
and we begin to tap into what the Apostle Paul is saying, he didn't like to be persecuted. He didn't like to be attacked physically and be stoned. He didn't like it when they beat him outside of cities after he'd ministered. He didn't like any of that. He didn't like the persecutions. But what he found, the greater the persecution, the greater level of grace he always tapped into and the more he learned and knew about God. God didn't attack him. No, Satan used his people to attack him. And what I want you to realize, when you're battling things in life and you're going through things in life, it's God's not teaching you a lesson by putting bad things on you. If he was doing that, wouldn't have Jesus said that in John 10, 10? No, he tells us if it's stolen from you, if it's killed, right, still killed, or if it's destroyed, that's of Satan. Jesus made it real clear. I call it the John 10, 10 line. So whenever you're wrestling your mind and trying to figure things out, the problem is we try to understand God from the natural mind and not through the spirit and through revelation. Grace can grow, but the only way grace can grow in you is the more you learn the word of God and the more the word of God becomes alive in you. Because John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. And on down there, seven or eight verses, it said, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who was it? Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus is not only the Son of God, not only our Lord and part of the Trinity, the Godhead, he's also the Logos, the Word. And the more of this you digest, the more this Word becomes alive to you and becomes real to you, the more of his grace you tap into and the more of abundance, abundant life you can live. And abundance to everyone is different. Some people say, well, if my house was paid for. Some say, if I just had a house. Some would say, you know, if my retirement was set. And some would say, well, I, no, I want retirement for five off. I want for five generations. Everybody's perception of abund <clears throat> abundance is different, but God's is not. And if God is willing to give Paul all sufficiency, the Bible says, he said, I am God in numbers. I, I am God. I cannot lie. The Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's a God that cannot lie. And another place in the Bible, it says, it says he is no respecter of persons. So if God is no respecter of persons and he's willing to give Paul all sufficiency, why can't every other child of God have all, all sufficiency? If he's willing to let him have great revelation, why can't all other children of God have great revelation? If he's willing to let him live in abundance, even through trials and temptations and so on, why, why can't other children of God? Because God doesn't pick favorites, right? We're all his kids. So when grace appears, disgrace disappears. I said when grace comes on the scene, it takes away the disgrace, the things that are coming against grace and the thing that are coming against the God that's in you. The only thing sufficient in life is not your challenges or attacks. The only thing that's sufficient in life is God's grace. Now, let me jump down and then I'm gonna come back to this in just a minute because, you know, God wants us to live more abundantly. Uh, well, let, let me read uh, 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8 first. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8, so it further explains this, and you hear us talk about this a lot here. And God is able to do what? God is able, that word able is ability, the root word for ability. God's ability is able to make what? All. Everybody say all. All. How, how much is all? Oh, all is all, right? There's nothing left, right? God is able to make what? All grace. Everybody say grace. Abound towards you come towards you. The key is, what are you doing with it? Do you see it? Do you feel it? Do you tap into it? God is able, his ability is for you to make all, everybody say all, grace, what? Channel towards you, come towards you. Why? That you, everybody say me, always having all sufficiency. Huh, wait a minute. How much sufficiency does God want me to have? Well, sufficiency means super abundant above what I could need or ask for. So when does God want me to have that? Always. He wants you to always having all, having, uh, all sufficiency, what? In all things. Everybody say all things. Does that include your health? Does that include your finances? Does that include your relationships? 
That includes your family? That includes your anointing and ministry? Does that include your business? Again, how much is all? And, and how often is always? Huh. Man, I mean, we make it complicated. You know, certain scholars that, that study a lot, and then they will, spit, they will write a book on just trying to tear that one verse apart. And God just said it. It's like, okay, I'm going to believe you or God. <laughs> okay? Said, in all things may have what? An abundance for every good work. The reason God wants you to walk in his grace, which is more than enough for you, which is all sufficiency and all things all the time. Why? Because then all the good things he wants you to do in life, to help the needy, to help the poor, you know, to minister to those that are broken or those that are addicted, to minister to those and help people get set free and break the spirit of suicide and break the spirit of murder and break the spirit of cancer. Why is that? He wants you to have everything you need to do any good work he asks you to do in that instant. You know, I've told you before, and you've heard it here, another way to spell faith other than F-A-I-T-H, what is it? How do you spell faith? R-I-S-K. Because really, what is it when we are walking in faith, and then all of a sudden God challenges us to do something, we take a risk. You know, I had faith that God was going to heal that, li that lady's eye. But I took a risk, maybe it wouldn't happen. Well, then I'll just be a fool for Jesus. Or I realized I thought I hurt him, but I missed him. I, I, felt, I was standing up there, wasn't shook at all when that guy's hearing level got to a four. And then it got to an eight. And I think it was more like a 12 out of 10 because I was way back there and I couldn't even hardly hear. I was like, man, if you could hear that dude and all this. And he, I said, count. And he went one. And then I did the different two, three. Why? <clears throat> because that's not me. That's him. And really, if we would begin to give God his due and his credit, we would realize that so many good things we're asking for, he's already given you, but you've got to have faith to receive it. How are you saved? You're saved what? By faith, through grace. Everything comes through grace. The two greatest gifts God ever gave us, the first gift was his son. He gave us Jesus, right? God gave Jesus what? So that we could be saved. And then what's the second thing he did? He gave us Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I must depart so another, the third part of the Godhead, can come and be with you. Parakletos, Holy Spirit. And not only is he with you, he's in you. Hmm. Moses in Romans chapter 5, it says, God gave the law, the word law is talking about being a tutor to us, uh, the law uh, to to uh, Moses gave the law, but Jesus came. Grace came. I'll share a scripture with you here in a moment about the embodiment of grace, but it, it, are you tracking with me right now? I mean, it seems so simple, doesn't it? But it can be difficult to live because we can only live according to what we see. What we perceive, what we understand, what we know. Something that wouldn't even challenge my faith, it's almost a habit, might take great faith for you to do. Or there might be something you could do that's so easy for you, but it would take great faith for me. See, what I want you to realize, when God's grace is operating at a high capacity in you, and God is just doing some great things in your life, if it's truly grace, you can't even explain it when people ask you. You just testify about it. You just testify about it. You can't even explain it. And, and you know what? If it's truly God's grace doing it, no one else can explain it but God. So when you see me do those things right there, uh, it, it's fun because God uses me because he's graced me to do certain things. But he said he's graced every believer to heal the sick and cast out devils. And that they'll go tell, talk about him and signs will follow them. That's Mark 16. That's a great commission. He's graced every one of you to do any of this. It doesn't mean you can just do it when you want. It's just whenever he's flowing and you sense it and you do what you just, on faith, you do what he asks you to do. You practice, you learn, you grow. But we've been talking a lot about gifts and power, but it works in your marriage. It works in your family. It works in your own health, right? And, and, and we begin to understand this great virtue of grace. Um, see, the key is, we got to get our capacity open 
get junk out, sin out, and, and, and pride out, and fear out, and all these things out of our heart, out of our spirit, so it opens us up for a bigger capacity to receive greater capacity of God's grace. We're the ones that has to do that. The Bible didn't say God will humble you. Everybody's, well, you know, all hell broke loose in my life. I guess God's just trying to teach me humility. No. The Bible says humble yourself. Humble yourself. We humble ourselves. God doesn't humble us. We're the ones. It's our job not to live in pride. It's our job to to walk and live in humility. So there's nothing, no good work that you can't do through grace. Just as you were saved through grace by faith, right? You, God's grace, Jesus himself died and rose again and by faith and believing that and receiving him into your heart, into your life. Now, we'll discover here now, I want to talk to you just a few minutes here. I won't keep you much longer, but I want to talk to you about this. Is that From the scriptures, we learned that grace is the virtue from which all the other spiritual gifts come from. Grace is the virtue from where all the other spiritual gifts come from. As we begin to realize that, <clears throat> grace can also be described as an anchor, uh, as some t- sort of anchor. So it, let's say a tree, for instance. The branches are virtues of God. Let's say they're virtues, they're gifts, they're love, they're all these different virtues of God, but the tree is grace. Oh, see, i got to read a scripture so you get this. Let's look at this scripture, and then we'll come back to that thought. Colossians 2, verses 9 and 10. It says, for in him, talking about Jesus, all, everybody say all, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All the fullness of the Godhead bodily is in who? What's the scripture say? Jesus. And you, who, who's that? Children of God, if you're born again and you're saved through that name, Jesus Christ, and you are complete in him, talking about Jesus, who is the head of all principality and power. So what's that saying? For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of of all principality and power. What is that saying? It's saying Jesus is the embodiment of the grace of God. He embodied the grace of God. So when you receive Jesus, you are receiving what? The embodiment of the grace of God. As we begin to think about things and and really get into the scriptures and learn and grow, when you're born again, who lives inside you? Holy Spirit, but Jesus is your Lord. He's actually at the right hand of the Father, but he has released Holy Spirit to be in you and with you and around you so you can learn and grow and do what he needs you to do. Well, why don't you realize, why do you have Holy Spirit in you? Because you receive the embodiment of Jesus. You receive that Jesus is not dead, he's alive. You receive the fact that Jesus came and paid for your sin and your sickness and your disease. And he what? Rose again. And you receive the embodiment that Jesus is the right hand of the Father. So now what happens is you receive the embodiment what, of Christ in you. And who is Christ? The Bible says Christ is grace. <clears throat> so all the other gifts that you receive, <clears throat> gifts of healings, Miracles, signs, wonders, whatever it is. Faith, love, hope, fruits of the Spirit. Anything you receive from God is a virtue of God, right? It's something that that is part of his person and personality. It's something that's a part of his nature. So me, I have certain virtues if you're around me, right? And, and, and you could tap into those virtues. Maybe, a, you know, a talent I have, a gift. What a, my talent and gifts, my virtues that I give you. But what I want you to realize here, and this is key, and this is what rocked me when I really got into this and saw this, and I heard it for the first time and I began to study it. Jesus is the embodiment 
of Father, Son, Holy Ghost, the embodiment. He, he, he embodied them what? So that we could have the fullness of the Godhead in us when we're born again. And in that, all the other virtues come from God. So you can pray for power, dunamis power, right? God's dunamis power. Power like a dynamite, like dynamite to explode and annihilate things. Power like a dynamo to rebuild and to, to transfer power. So we can walk in the dunamis power of God as believers, right? Especially when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. He said this power, this dunamis power is going to come on you. So as we begin to realize that we can live, what is that power? That power is a virtue of God. We can love people that hate us. That's not something you do naturally as a human. That can only be done by the grace of God that he gives you the capacity to love someone that tries to destroy you. We can love things that we never would have loved before because it's part of the virtue of God. It's part of his talents, his gifts that he bestows upon us. But here's the difference. That's talking about power and other things. But what I want you to understand about grace all these other gifts come from God, but the Bible says it is the grace of God. He is grace. Jesus is the embodiment of grace, so therefore, you're not just receiving one of his virtues. He is the embodiment. He is the tree trunk where all the branches and vines come from. There can't be any fruit without any branches. And there can't be any uh, branches without a tree. And there can't be a tree without roots, right? All that root system and tree, what? Comes from God and he distributes it through his grace. So grace is not a piece of God. <coughs> grace is all of God. So God doesn't grow in grace. He is grace. Hmm. You get that? God doesn't, he can't grow, he, he is grace. He's the embodiment of grace. But think about this for a second. Who has to grow then? We do. We have to expand our capacity through messages like this, through studying the word, through prayer, through fasting, through seeking God, knowing God, understanding God, like Paul, suffering some stuff, going through some hard knocks. You know, man, when you go through something, when, how many of you, when you gotta do something really important and you blow it and miss it, that's hard to forget, isn't it? But you could do nine other great things and oh, did I do that? Oh, that was cool. When did that happen? But boy, that one thing you blew, oh God, you, you, know, every, you know how I, everything about it, right? It, it, it's registered in your heart, in your mind. And what I want you to do is realize that this great work that God has done is when you and I began to what? Romans 12, 2 says, be not conformed to this world but be you transformed by what? The renewing of your mind to prove what is God's good, acceptable, and perfect will. The greater revelation I get is what? The greater revelation I get is God's good, acceptable, and perfect will. It's not three different levels of will. It didn't say good or acceptable or perfect will. And means also. And what happens is when my mind is renewed, not that I'm smarter or there's a, when my mind is what? Renewed, not of this world, but renewed of God, who he is and what he's about, what happens when my mind is renewed and then I begin to know his will, his way, his truth. He created the world. There isn't anything if he says do it, I can't do. Now there's some things I'd like to do that I can't do. But if God said do it, I can do it. I'll risk it. No biscuit, you don't risk it. Well, thing about me, I'll risk it if I know it's God. And I'll die on that hill, my wife knows, I'll die on that hill if I know it's God. Now, I, and I just, I just have that in me. Now, there's a lot of other things I need in my life, that's for sure. A lot of his virtues need to, I have a, need a bigger capacity for, I don't have all of the capacity for all of grace either. But I'm working on it. I have a greater capacity now than I did a year ago. I have a greater capacity now than I did 10 years ago. I have a greater capacity now than I did 30 years ago. What? You make room, you open yourself up so you can receive more of him. Listen, power is limited. Power comes and goes. Positions are limited. They come and go. Titles are limited. They come and go. 
But grace remains the same because it's always there and it's all sufficient in all things for every good work. So if you're pursuing power, you're limited. I want more power. I want to lay hands on people. I want to preach the gospel. Or I want to be a billionaire. I want power. You can seek it, but even if you get it, it's limited because money runs out. And if it don't, you can't take it with you. Your, your power goes when you leave this body. The Bible says absent when you're dying, you're absent with this body, you're present with the Lord. You ain't going to be over the Lord. You might be over everybody else in your life. You ain't going to be over God. All that's limited, but grace is not. So when you pray, don't pray for power. Pray for more grace. See, we just look at grace as forgiveness. And if I had time, I'd take you through Exodus and some other stuff to show you that that's not what mercy is the forgiveness piece. Grace is the reward you get because you ask for forgiveness. That's why it says in Hebrews 4.12, uh, come into the throne room, what the throne room of grace with boldness to receive help in your time of need. Come into the throne room of grace. How do you do it? It's set up another verse or two through the high priest, through the priest Jesus, right? You come through. You have not a God which cannot fill your infirmities. In other words, he fills your infirmities. He, he knows what you're going through. So you have that. And it says you, if you're a child of God, can come into the throne room of grace with boldness. Wow. That you don't have to cry, oh, Lord, could you help me? Oh, Jesus, could you not possibly bless me? You are healed. You are blessed. First Peter 2, 24, by his stripes, you were healed. Now you just got to get the capacity to receive your healing. What is it? Get more word. Get more revelation. Seek more. Learn more. Be open more. Trust more. You want to be financially independent so you can do great things for God. Well, you better do what Meg said. You better be tithing because if you don't return back to God, what's God? He says in Malachi 3, you're a thief. You think God's going to bless a thief? No, he's waiting for the thief to cry mercy. But the instant the thief cries mercy, he's forgiven. And then he gets grace. Then you get what Parker preached last week. But it comes through the mercy seat. Who's on the mercy seat? Jesus. Who embodies grace? Jesus. Who is grace? Jesus. If you get all of Jesus, you got all power. If you get all of God, you got all power. If you get all of the Holy Spirit, you got all power. So why are you seeking something that's a virtue of something you have very little of? The only limit you have and the only limit I have is my capacity to understand and receive grace. You know what I started doing? I brought me a big old bottle of oil home. And, you know, I was part of laying hands on other people for, you know, to increase their capacity of grace and God said I want you to take this big old bottle of olive oil and every morning get up and proclaim my grace over you so every morning I get up where I feel good or bad and I just nod my head and say Lord I just thank you for more grace more grace Lord every day I just anoint my mind I choose to speak it out vocally God give me more grace Lord help me receive more grace he can't give me anymore until I open up to receive it Then it's consummated in me. But it comes to you renewing your mind. What's that mean? Get my mind. You know, it's, some people are so pseudo-spiritual, they're stupid. You know, what's the old saying? You're so heavenly bound, you're no earthly good. The problem is they're not even, they're, they're not even heavenly bound. They're just religious. They're bound. They're not bound like going somewhere. They're bound up. In their own understanding. I can wear this, I can't wear this. I can do this, I can't do this. If you're still all caught up in the doo-doo stuff, that's where your life is. And that's a nice way to say it. Do, I do this, God loves me. If I do that, I'm anointed. If I do this, he cares for me. If I do that, he must favor me. That's doo-doo. Doo-doo-doo, right there, there's three of them. Religious people live in doo-doos. And they're bound by their doo-doos. If I do this, if I don't do that, if I don't do that, if I do this, that's doo-doo. But grace is all sufficient. 
Grace is the answer to everything. And we look at grace like it's mercy. Well, just give me mercy. Look, the sin that the sins that uh, David committed in human standards blew anything Saul ever did out. I mean, to have an adulterous affair with one of your lead soldiers, put him in front so he gets killed, you basically murdered a man and took his wife. But David got down, weeped and cried and called, Mercy! Forgive me, Father! Mercy! And God restored him. Saul, he went to the witch of Endor because he was already living such an unforgiving, jealous life. Remember when David came back and the, the ladies were singing, oh, Saul kills his thousands, but David kills his tens of thousands. And that day, pride, anger, and unforgiveness rose up in Saul, and he was never the same since. Until eventually he got so far into those spirits, those familiar spirits, he even sought those spirits to find out how to do battle and do war and went to the witch of Endor. Once he did that, God said, you're done. So if you're trying to measure sin out, guys, sin is sin. Jesus said, well, you talk about committing adultery. If you look on another man's wife to lust after, you just committed adultery. Oh, I didn't really commit adultery. We just petted or we just have great relationship. And so what Jesus said. He said, you committed adultery. He said, you don't have to sleep with her or you don't have to sleep with him. That's adultery. Well, you know, uh, uh, you know that person over there, they're just a mess. Let me tell you a few little uh, splinters they got in their eyes. Let me tell you a few little nuggets about them, how they're missing it. They need, we need to pray for them. Let's talk about them. You know what Jesus said about that person's splinters? He said, won't you get the log out of your own eye? Get that tree out of your eye, and then you might be able to see how to help the person with the splinters. So what we call sin, we don't even have a clue. What you need to do and I need to do is cry mercy. Mercy is the entrance to grace. If you want greater grace, cry more mercy. If you want more grace, cry more mercy. If you want more power, cry more mercy. If you want to love more, cry mercy. God, help me to love those that don't love me. Some of you need to cry, God, help me love myself. <laughs> because you wouldn't treat anyone else like you treat yourself. The way you abuse your mind, the way you abuse your body, the way you abuse people that love you. You need to cry mercy. And realize it's not about you. It's about him and about others. We're not here for ourselves. We're here for God the Father and we're here for those he puts us in front of. So signs can follow us. God didn't call you to look for signs. He called you to do his will so that signs will follow you. Everybody say grace. 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 So when I say that word, the connotation to us is forgiveness. That's mercy. Grace is the embodiment of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, who is Jesus? Not only the Son of God. It says, he is the what? King of all kings. He is the Lord of all lords. Every name that is mentioned must bow its knee to that name that's above all names. Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. Every knee. Cancer. Depression, fear, anxiety, lust, anything, it doesn't matter. Unforgiveness, bitterness, hatred, racism, everything. Got to bow its name. Hey, if it's got a name, it's going to bow. Good things and bad things. You, you, you think only bad people bow to a king? No, everyone that comes into the presence of royalty, king, they must bow. So if you haven't been bowing lately, you might have a little pride in there. You said, thing in Eastern Kentucky, you say, watch it, watch that girl going on the road. She's so proud, she's stuck up. She's stuck on herself. What's it mean? They're stuck up. Or that guy, he's stuck up. He thinks he's all right. Look at what's it mean? He's, like, he's stuck up. What's it mean? It means he's stuck straight. He can't bow down. He can't come down to your level. He, he's, all he sees is up here. He can't see anybody down here. What was that great line that Parker preached last week about bent knee? 
Bent knees break chains. And so how, how, how are you going to break chains off your life of addiction and lust and fear and, and unforgiveness and self-pity and groveling and whatever else it is you're dealing with? How are you going to break it? Bend your knees. Humble yourself. Cry mercy. God, give me more grace. God, give me more grace for myself. Give me more grace for others. See, in grace is power. That every other gift you're asking for, unconditional love and all that, that all comes from virtue. Because virtue is the, that grace is, that all comes from grace. That grace is the only virtue that's of God. The rest come from him through grace. So whatever you're believing for, whatever you need this morning, then you just need more grace. Now, get this clear. God's not growing in grace. He is grace. It's finished. Didn't Jesus say it's finished? Before he took his life, it's finished. What was he saying? It's finished. He said, forgive them for no wrong. They don't know what they do. Beat me, embarrass me, judge me, put me up here naked between two thieves. Put me up here naked so my mom and everybody else that thinks anything about me see me naked, beaten, you can't recognize my body. And rise, they get ready. But he said, Father, forgive them for they, know, they don't know what they're doing. In other words, God, they, they, don't, they, they live by the law. It's their tutor. They don't, they don't even know what sin is. They don't even know what they're doing. But Lord, forgive them. What's that? He cried mercy for us. What was he saying? Give those people mercy. Give them mercy. He cried mercy. He's crying mercy over you right now. There's scriptures that talk about in the Bible that, that he's constantly crying mercy over us. I mean, when we're running on our tant tantrum or we're upset, or we're he's crying mercy. When, when, when we're walking in unforgiveness and hatred and racism, God's crying mercy. When we're battling some disease or trying to take our life, God's crying mercy for you. See, all you got to do is come to the mercy seat, the throne room of God in the time of need to get your need met, come into the mercy seat, come to the mercy seat, the throne of God with boldness. You know, if Parker and Pierce, when they were younger and they come to the house, they didn't say, hey dad, can I get you know, a soft drink out of the fridge? Hey dad, can I get a cup of water? Hey dad, can I have dinner tonight? They own that house. They got more wear and tear out of it than we ever did. We're still cleaning up stuff they tore up. They're sitting over here like they didn't do nothing now. Why? They were bold. That's their house. But let a neighbor kid come over and do that to my house. I probably do what we used to do in Eastern Kentucky when I grew up, spank his butt and go over and see if they got a problem, say, here's your kid. Just tore my house up. <laughs> no, I probably wouldn't do that. Probably. I'm working on that mercy thing myself. <laughs> Are you starting to get this? I mean, I know it's like a fire hydrant to you right now. You can take any one of those scriptures and study a month on them. And I'm just getting it in me. But boy, I know good things are ahead. Good things are ahead. Like Meg said, and that's the word God gave me for, for uh, Pastor Isaac's church, house of miracles. House of miracles. And, and really, we're all miracles. The greatest miracle is salvation. Man, that God could save a wretch like me. Man, I certainly didn't. I was a VIP center. I was good at it, man. I was good at that stuff. Still got to watch it. I can be good at it now, too. You know, I just clothe it differently now. You know, I got different titles for it now, but it comes from the same heart. It comes from the same undone heart. Righteous indignation. Well, you got to be righteous before you can do that. I'm meddling now. Heavy meddling preacher here. Hallelujah. What am I doing? I'm letting it soak into you right now. Because what I'm going to do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you stand and I'm going to start speaking over your life. And when I come to it, say amen. What's amen mean? So be it. If you don't want it, don't say it. Let's stand. Hallelujah. Bruce, could I say that? 
Get ready. I want everybody to do it with me. If you don't, that's your problem. But I'm telling you, what happens is, when I teach you something, you get, a, you get some of it. But when I make proclamations over your life and you receive it, it multiplies it in you. It accelerates the revelation. It accelerates the understanding. There's things you'll walk out and I don't quite understand, but ooh, I feel different. That means that there's prophecy working in your life. Because when you're preaching the word, you're releasing the spirit of prophecy. It's not just some other book. This is not a book about Hemingway or some dead president or something. This is a book about the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is a book about grace. This is a house of grace. You can't have miracles without grace. Hallelujah. So say, be ready here. So you're the head and not the tail. You're above and not beneath. No weapon formed against you can prosper. You're healed and not sick. You're living. You're strong. You're mighty. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in this world. I'm God's child. I'm full of grace. I'm full of faith. I'm healed. I'm free. I'm anointed. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Give God a shout of praise. Give God a shout of praise. Hey, listen to me. Do it again. I'm never going back. I'm never going to lose again. I'm never going to quit again. I'm never going to stop again. I'm only going forward. I'm pushing through. I'm pressing through. Through grace. Through grace. Through grace. Give God another shout of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.